Mr. Bergeron on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hi, and welcome to kind of an extended version of uh, Bergeron Briefs. Uh, many of you have met Sandy Cordobi before, who is with us today. Um, and, we are, and we are here in wonderful Connecticut. We left Massachusetts uh, to interview two people from the Center for Medicare Advocacy regarding a case um, that they successfully uh, worked on um, um, where the other side was the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And it, is, it may transform um, the way that um, nursing home care services get delivered and services at home get delivered to a, to a number of patients. So I think it was important to me that you hear about this case, so that's why we came to Connecticut to talk about it. First, can we talk a little bit about the Center for Medicare Advocacy, which I only learned about as a result of this case? Sure. Margaret Murphy, who are you and what do you do here and what is the Center for Medicare Advocacy? Sure. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm the associate director here. I'm an attorney. I was one of the um, attorneys on the Jimmo versus Sebelius case. Uh, the center has been around since 1986. Our founder, mm -hmm. uh, Judith Stein, is uh, also an attorney and she's had a legal services background and um, when she decided that she wanted to do more work with older people and disabled people, um, she founded the center and found a way to fund it. And uh, so she's been doing this work for a long time. And uh, the Jimmo settlement is a culmination of decades of you know, peace, you know, she saw people being denied care, and so this is like, uh, you know, this is gonna she's be very really big. happy. Of, so you know, is she going to retire on this one? Is this like no, the big? No, she's not win? allowed no. to retire. So no, she's still. <laughs> she's got to implement it. Now, now she's we, got a second, you know, a second you, life. You, know, doing you, this? you win, and now you've got to like, you know, push forward and make no. sure it gets implemented properly. And, and actually, this conversation today is part of that. Is really part of that. Ali, mm -hmm. can you just tell us about yourself? I've heard that you're not actually from Connecticut. You live That's the far secret. away. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm Allie Bears. I'm also an attorney here at the center, and I helped with the litigation of the Jimmo case. Um, and uh, yes, I, um, I'm a Western Massachusetts resident, and before working at the center, um, worked with the Medicare um, Advocacy Project, which is a Massachusetts-based Medicare advocacy program um, in the legal services offices at Massachusetts. So I had experience doing uh, work with Medicare beneficiaries and um, saw the types of cases that led to the to the Jimmo case there um, before I came to work here. And, and we were talking a little bit about the Medicare Advocacy Project before we started today, and I'm going to ask you to talk about that a little bit more later. Can, can, can you talk a little bit about from your experience, I know we were talking about this earlier, what it was that led to Jimmo, why you folks decided to undertake this kind of really intimidating litigation against Medicare, which is, <laughs> that's a big, that's a big player on the right. other side, right? Can you just talk about that? Yeah, sure. So what we were seeing were people were calling the center and saying, you know, my mom was in the hospital, she's in a nursing home, she had a massive stroke, you know, we want to get her back home, but they're telling us that she's not improving, and so they're going to cut off her therapy after, you know, 20 days. She's not improving. Not she's improving. plateaued. She's plateaued. The term that we always hear, she's plateaued. Thing, thing we, things we heard were, you know, people are not improving, they've plateaued, they're chronic and stable. Um, I had a client in Maine who um, was, uh, was injured in a farming accident as a teenager, and she was now in her 80s, and she lived in her own home, and she had always been independent, but because of her... Um, you know, lower uh, limb extre extremity uh, paralysis, she was in a wheelchair and she had a tendency to develop wounds. Mm -hmm. And so she ended up in the hospital and got, you know, surgery. And so it was just really an intensive um, wound. She was also diabetic, so it was very slow healing. And she could not get a home health agency into her home. And they said it was because these wounds are going to take forever to heal if they heal at all. And Medicare will not pay for that. And by the way, when you say a home health agency, I, it's been my experience that the most common home health agency is a visiting nurses association. Yeah. Is that the most? Um, those are often, and I yeah. think that's the nonprofit side, I believe. There's also, you know, for profit, uh, in Connecticut at least, we have mm -hmm. both, you know, VNAs and, and other types of home health agencies. But VNA is very uh, common, even in, even in Connecticut. And by the way, I wanted you to hear that story because I bet every one of us has heard that term, oh, 
your benefits are done because you plateaued or because you're not improving anymore. Right. So you heard that that was true, but isn't isn't that isn't that the law? <laughs> isn't that the law? The the law is uh, ha, the Medicare and has law been. The law is, is and, has and has been. been that there is no requirement that a person improve in order to get coverage of Medicare services. Mm -hmm. Um, the reality um, was that there was this deeply ingrained myth in Medicare that tr transferred into the medical community mm -hmm. that unless you were showing improvement, you couldn't get coverage. And that would lead to these situations where a person it, it would be, in a way, required to decline, um, not get care for a while in order to then requalify and for care to get you back up to um, where you could have been all along if you had had the coverage to maintain. Um, so what we saw was that uh, although the law only um, requires the need for skilled care mm -hmm. um, and states right in the regulations that restoration potential is not the deciding factor for coverage. And it used to say that in the regulations? It, it yes. does and it still does. does. Oh, I believe always has yeah. um, yeah. said that in the regulations, restoration potential not the deciding factor. Um, that basically came to be the proxy for skilled care. That was it. Did you have restoration potential? Yeah. Instead of looking at, is there another reason you might need skilled care? Do you have special medical complications? Do you have, is it the kind of care that requires um, the skills and judgment of a uh, professional therapist or nurse to take care of you? And so people would get denied. Um, people would try to appeal, but it was sort of like swimming against the tide. Mm -hmm. so individual people, you could win sometimes, individual cases. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. could go up to an administrative law judge. You could point to that regulation um, and sometimes win individual cases, sometimes even going up to um, the federal court level uh, after you exhausted the administrative appeals within the Medicare system. Yeah. And that did happen sometimes. Um, people would win at the district court level. Um, I remember but, reading some cases that exactly. were individual cases, but, but Medicare never bought into those cases. Well, they didn't. They, the key was that they never appealed them um, right. so that it would just remain um, at that individual level so that there I was see. never a, a, a sort of a, a case that addressed it systemically. And right. after so many years of dealing with this, the center realized we need a case that deals with this systemically. Because you, you, you had mentioned, and by the way, Sandy, you, you had mentioned to me that, that I mean, we were both surprised when we heard about Jim O because we both said to ourselves, oh, isn't that plateauing? Isn't that the standard? I remember, but you've hit cases like that yourself. I right? have, and in, in, uh, you know, with 18 years and being in home care as a director of a home care agency, the, the sort of mindset was is that the, the clients need to either be getting worse or getting better. But providing care for somebody other than for a very short time, once they had sort of hit a, a plateau, yeah. was unheard of. And, and the regulations have always said that that you know if there was a reasonable expectation that the patient could decline that you needed to stay in but um, but that just wasn't the practice it and just wasn't right. this was going to be a big thing to try to get everybody to change that and, and I know that Allie when we were talking earlier you had mentioned that you had actually been invited to or you had done a presentation to some providers to kind of talk to them about this this was before you did this case can you just kind of talk to that what that experience was because I think that the the role of the providers in terms of this, these next steps is going to be absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was working in Massachusetts, I would um, meet on a regular basis with the nursing home ombuds people who were assigned to the nursing homes in our region, mm -hmm. and we would talk to them about different issues, and this came up a lot, and they often had um, patients and their families come to them and yeah. saying, you know, we think that the person does require more physical therapy, um, but the nursing home is saying no coverage. And so we had spoken to them a lot. They understood what the law was and what the standard was supposed to be. And one of them said, why don't we invite some uh, nursing home people uh, to a meeting and we can talk about the issue and we can sort of do a presentation about how the improvement standard isn't really the law and yeah. um, that there really is additional Medicare coverage available. Um, and uh, the we had uh, administrators, directors of nursing, those types of yeah. people come to the presentation. And they were um, overwhelmed, right? They got, well, they, they got you know, converted on they, the, on the they, spot. they yeah. heard what we had to say yeah. and they understood what we were saying, but they didn't believe that, and you know, based on what they were in fact seeing, that that was how Medicare was going to process the claims, and they were very uh, worried about being accused 
of fraud if they did anything else because right. what they understood was that you had to show, for example, in a physical therapy program that you were working towards some goal and the person was moving toward that goal or you wouldn't have coverage. And if you did something otherwise, that that claim would be rejected um, and you ran the risk of being accused of fraud. So they really didn't want to change practices until they saw something coming from Medicare saying this is actually the proper way to, to process claims.